Good afternoon, alumni and friends. I'm Tom Pico. I'm the president and CEO for the University of Maine Alumni Association. We're excited to continue our periodic webinar series to reach UMaine alumni near and far with updates on a variety of topics from the University of Maine. And we're thrilled with the response to today's topic. We had over 400 people register for this webinar. So we're very excited about that. As you know, today we'll discuss a landmark achievement at the University of Maine that was unveiled in November, which is the development of the world's first 3D printed home made completely with bio-based materials. It's amazing to drive down Rangeley Road on the backside of our campus and see the BioHome 3D behind the Advanced Structures and Composite Center, which is a tangible reminder to all of us for the groundbreaking work happening here at the University of Maine and yet another reason for all of us as UMaine alumni to be proud of our alma mater. Before we hear from Dr. Habib Dagger about this remarkable achievement, I'm pleased to welcome President Joan Farini Monday, who would like to offer a, a, a brief welcome to you all. As you may know, she became the president of the University of Maine and the University of Maine at Machias in July of 2018. And since 2021 has also served the University of Maine system as vice chancellor for research and innovation. President Freeney Mundy, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Tom, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, no, I'm not inside the 3D printed home, but it's a sneak preview of what it looks like. Um, I would, I'd like to thank all of our University of Maine alumni, friends, business leaders. I'm scanning down through the list. What a wonderful audience we have today to get the chance to speak with Dr. Dagger and hear about this incredible achievement here at the University of Maine. As you know, the second semester has opened. Uh, we are here, um, along with everybody else, trying to avoid uh, snow days and uh, too many too many um, challenges that come with that. I will say that some of you may know that the Mahaney Dome on campus occasionally has trouble with weather and we did have a collapse today. No one was hurt at all, um, but you may see that in the news. And so it's ironic and interesting to be talking about structures uh, today as we look at one on our very own campus that um, that uh, is quite susceptible to weather. Um, you know, there are so many reasons for you all to be proud of your alma mater and uh, those of you who are friends for you to be our advocates and our colleagues and our champions to, to help us um, attract the next generation of black bears to come to the University of Maine. But I was reminded today in an earlier meeting on a different topic of, of part of what um, is so special about this university. And when you think about the achievement of this 3D printed home, um, and you think about really what it takes to get to it, which is a, a lot of basic research, um, a lot of applied research and experimentation, um, and then uh, conversations about innovation, commercialization. How do we how do we eventually get the the work um, out into public use, wide use? All of those pieces, the basic, the applied, the innovation, and the commercialization, those all happen here at the University of Maine, all in our own ecosystem. We are not a place that sort of lands only in one of those areas. And what that means is the faculty, the students, the staff, the colleagues, the partners from outside um, find themselves driven by curiosity, by intention of solving problems, by working together to meet new challenges and make new inventions and make new understandings of the world. And that piece of our research enterprise um, is I think part of what has helped, helped us get to be in our one institution because we have all of that built in here. You're going to see a classic perfect example of it today. Um, we joined together here on campus in November, as many of you know, to celebrate the unveiling of the world's first 3D printed house made entirely of bio-based materials. I couldn't be more happy than to introduce you all um, to, to um, the team that will tell you about this led by Habib. So I'll turn it back to Tom Pico. Thank you to the Alumni Association for organizing this event today. Thank you, President Freeney Mundy, for being with us today. We appreciate it. Bef um, before we turn to uh, Dr. Dogger, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. First, we want to make sure everyone is aware that today's session is being recorded, and we will share this recording online at a later date for those who are unable to join us today. And secondly, we will have time for a few questions at the end. And if you'd like to submit a question, please send that in the chat to the Zoom host, Nicolette Hashi from the Alumni Association team here, and she will relay those questions to me to ask at the end. And we'll get to as many questions as we can uh, and keep to our one hour time frame wrapping up at one o'clock. Now for our presentation, um, I'm pleased to introduce to you Dr. Habib Dagger. Dr. Dagger is the founding executive director of the Advanced Structures and Composite Center, 
a National Science Foundation funded research center housed in a 100,000 square foot laboratory with more than 260 full and part-time personnel. The Humane Composite Center is a world leader in the development of low-cost, high-performance structural composites for construction. The center has served more than 500 clients worldwide and has received top national awards for its research. Dr. Dagger holds more than 120 patents, has over 100 publications, and has received numerous awards, including uh, being honored by the Humane Alumni Association as our 1995 Distinguished Maine Professor, which we're proud of. Habib, thank you so much for taking the time to share with our alumni and friends today. Thank, thank you very much, Tom, and uh, really appreciate you organizing this. And thank you, alumni, for for joining us here today. I'm delighted to spend a little bit of time with you and let you know what's going on uh, in our laboratory at the Advanced Structures and Composite Center. Uh, I came to UMaine as a faculty member uh, 37 years ago, and I'm hoping for 37 more years. Uh, uh, and I, I'm proud to tell you that my wife and my four children are also UMaine alumni, UMaine Black Bear. So very proud to the fact that they, they all went to UMaine. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and talk about the Advanced Structures and Composite Center first. Uh, tell you about who we are, what we do, where we're heading, uh, and, and then um, go ahead and talk about two major programs we're working on. I'm going to give you a little bit of update on what's going on with our offshore wind program. There's been a lot in the media here. Just uh, yesterday in the media, I was all talking about a bill to to uh, procure floating offshore wind in the, in the Gulf of Maine. We'll talk a bit about that. And then I'm going to focus on additive manufacturing, 3D printing, and what can we do to help solve um, our housing crisis in the state of Maine. And then what most importantly is, is really how we're educating students within the SCC uh, and within the University of Maine to become leaders. Students who get involved in research work 30 hours a week as undergrads in a laboratory like ours and, and get paid to do it. And, and, and by doing so, it transforms their education. Uh, President Ferrini Monday wanted to give every student uh, at the University of Maine a research experience because of what it does in terms of uh, opening up their eyes. Uh, to, to the world. And, and what we're trying to do at ASCC is take this the next level and give them a fully immersive research experience. So a student can actually work in our laboratory up to 30 hours a week in the academic year and full-time in the summer and the breaks. By the time they graduate, they're really transformed. And, and so research and education at UMaine are really one and, and all working together. Research helps educate students, students develop research and become leaders. So I'll give you some examples and, and we'll uh, go ahead and share my screen now. Does everyone see my screen? Okay, let me see if I can go to full screen. It would be a little bit better. Is the screen visible, full screen? It okay. is. Excellent. Um, so this is Biohome 3D. Uh, it's the, as, as you heard earlier, it's it's a sustainable approach to affordable housing. I'll get to that in more details a bit later. Uh, but but why are we going, why are we trying to 3D print homes? Well, first, first and foremost, Maine has a major housing crisis. Uh, we have close to 20,000 low income homes needed in Maine. Uh, people, uh, employers can't bring people to Maine because people can't find homes to live in. Um, and we also have a major crisis with the homeless population as well within the state. Uh, according to Maine Housing, who's a partner for us at this Maine State Housing, um, the, 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 uh, a, a 600 square foot, one bedroom, low income home can cost upwards of $300,000 in Maine today, even if you can get one. Uh, and, and if you start asking yourself, What's causing that? Why? Why is it that it's so expensive? Of course, the pandemic had a had a, a big part of driving the cost of materials up and the supply chain uh, cost up and, and and availability. So the cost of materials are up. But the other big issue is we don't have the labor to build the homes. There's not enough people to build homes. Now, even if we had the money to build them today, we can't find people to build them. That's what Main State Houses Housing tells me today. So to solve the problem, we got to go to the root causes of it. 
And the root cause of it is the cost of materials and the lack of labor. And by going to 3D printing using wood-based materials, uh, residuals from our forest, we can use low-cost materials. Uh, and, and by using 3D printing and automating, we can reduce our labor costs, uh, uh, our labor demands, if you wish. So that's that's where we're heading. Uh, we're not going to solve the problem overnight. It's a big problem. Nationally, it's a big problem. There's 8 million low-income homes needed nationally. So I'll tell you about that in just a short while, but I'm going to go back and tell you about the Advanced Structures and Composite Center first. Uh, so, and then we'll talk about offshore wind a bit. So the Advanced Structures and Composite Center, we established that uh, over a quarter century ago through a National Science Foundation grant. The goal was to add value to our natural resources. And, and uh, since we got started, we financially uh, sponsored over 2,700 humane students from 35 different academic departments. These students leave their classrooms, come to the lab and work in the lab to solve real problems, you, you're working with real people from real other disciplines and learn how to work in teams, learn how to work together, learn, learn how to innovate together uh, it, it, and learn how to have deadlines that they can meet. And, and so students, um, uh, their education is transformed. Uh, they, by the time they graduate, they have more than two years of full-time equivalent experience. And we're trying to take these students to become leaders that will take these technologies and implement them in society. Um, uh, we've um, this is what our lab looks like today, and uh, and and I'd like to say that uh, over the last few years we've grown quite a bit. We've become the largest university-based research center in Maine, thanks to the vision of the leadership at the University of Maine at the system level uh, to make us a leader in 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 R and D, uh, not only in Maine but globally. Um, so I'd like to thank President Farini Mundi and our chancellor and the entire leadership of the University of Maine, uh, our vice president for research, for enabling UMaine to become an R1 institution. Uh, we're so proud that we are now in the top 4% of, of universities in the countries and colleges in research, uh, in research and development. Uh, uh, this is, these are some of our partners and clients. Uh, at the Advanced Structures and Composite Center. We have over 500 partners and clients globally. Uh, and these, uh, so our students who work with us in the center are able to uh, reach that network and work with companies globally in, in designing new technologies and implementing them in society. Um, the, the, I'm so proud of, of the, uh, the, the center staff. We have over 300 people who work at the center now. Uh, and and they've received over 40 national, international excellence awards. Uh, for example, um, the White House called us champions of change, and we were at the White House being recognized for that. Um, engineering News Record uh, called us the top 25 newsmakers in the world in engineering. Um, uh, uh, we've received three Guinness World Records, and, and the American Society of Civil Engineers um, have the uh, is the largest civil engineering society in the world. Um, um, uh, it, it gave us the award, the Charles Spanko Award, the, the biggest award in innovation globally in the field of civil engineering. So, so a lot of good things are happening at UMaine uh, thanks to the the leadership that we have and that's allowing this to happen. Um, in 2020, we put together a strategic plan at the center, and we call it GEM, and that stands for Green Energy and Materials. Our goal is to bring green energy and materials to society. And at the same time, not only develop new technologies, but develop and educate leaders who can take these technologies and implement them in society. Um, because otherwise, uh, if we 3D print at home, well, who's going, who's going to out there and build them? Who, who, can, who knows how to do it? Well, nobody does. So we have to develop the leaders at the University of Maine that, that can take these technologies and implement them in society. So GEM stands for Green Energy and Materials, and it's our strategic plan. Examples of things we've done uh, recently, many of you may, may have driven over the Penobscot Narrows Bridge. Most of you don't know that the University of Maine is actually spying on the Penobscot Narrows Bridge and actually has put some composite tendons, strands in the bridge uh, that, that are quite a bit lighter than, than steel and that don't corrode like steel does. And we're testing them in a bridge like that, uh, working with the Maine Department of Transportation and, and Federal Highway Administration. So when you drive over that, please remember the University of Maine is a part of that bridge uh, that's being evaluated. This is a bridge we built uh, recently uh, in, in Hamden, Maine, using a technology invented in this lab. We have a company that spun off the laboratory called Advanced Infrastructure Technologies are building bridges right now using composite materials. The advantage of that is these, 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 uh, these structures weigh less than 
one fifth the weight of a, of a concrete structure. And, uh, and these were made in Maine, uh, these, these bridges um, at, at a company in Brewer that spun off our lab uh, and installed in Hamden here uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, and, uh, and that superstructure is so light that two, uh, two of these girders were lifted at once uh, and, and placed across the abutments. And it took less than a day to install the superstructure, the, the girders, because they're so light and easy to put together. Now, these girders um, were um, designed and invented at the University of Maine. We have a patent at UMaine uh, for this uh, for, for this technology, and it's been licensed by, by the company in Brewer, Maine, and they're fabricating these bridges and shipping them across the country. Uh, and, and these bridges are so neat, they're U-shaped, um, uh, so you can stack them together uh, on, a, on a flatbed truck. Uh, recently, they shipped um, a, a two-span bridge uh, to uh, Fort Myers, Florida, uh, made in Brewer, Maine, uh, on one flatbed. Okay, it was two-span, two-lane bridge because it's so light, and these girders nest together. Um, so uh, there's an example of, of of a technology that reduces um, the carbon footprint, if you wish, because you have lighter uh, lighter uh, components that last longer. Uh, imagine every generation replacing our bridges. Think about the ways to society replace bridges every generation. Can we build bridges that will last twice as long so our society is, has a smaller footprint? That's what we're working on uh, in, in many of our projects. Uh, we're also uh, working on uh, helping NASA put people on Mars. Uh, uh, we, it, it meant, if you, you can, you can uh, uh, look it up. Uh, uh, the technology is called the HIAD. And what it is, um, it's an inflatable decelerator um, that, um, uh, that allows a 40-ton 40 40 ton spacecraft uh, to slow down and, and be landed. And it's, a, it's, a, it's like a big airbag that you, you inflate from a nose cone of the spacecraft, uh, and it's got a heat shield on it. And that airbag is made with a concentric tori uh, that you see here, essentially a bunch of tubes made out of composite materials, a very lightweight, and you inflate that, slow down the spacecraft enough, and eventually pull a parachute and land it. And, and that's the, one of the major technologies that NASA is looking at to put people on Mars. And, and guess what? You main students are working on these technologies right in our lab. And some of these, are, uh, some of our students are interning with NASA uh, as well, uh, working on these projects. This is a, 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 a Maine, as you know, is a big boat building state. This is an all composite boat uh, that's spinning at 50 knots in the Gulf of Maine that was designed by you Maine engineers and students. Um, in, in, and uh, we worked with Hodgson Yachts in Southeast Harbor uh, to, develop, to develop this boat. Um, but I want to move over to um, a big issue that we're all faced with and, and as a society is, how do we clean up the environment? How do we clean up our energy system? Um, uh, and um, climate change and global climate change is the biggest um, issue that as a society we're facing right now. So we, Maine spends about 3.6 to $5.8 billion per year in buying fossil fuels, heating oil and gasoline and natural gas. Um, and what we found out is in the Gulf of Maine, there's enough offshore wind capacity uh, so that if we just harness 3% of the surface area of the Gulf of Maine, just 3% of that within 50 miles, we can electrify heating and transportation in Maine. So think about that with 3% of the, of the energy, offshore wind energy in the Gulf of Maine, we can all be driving electric cars 20 or 30 years from now. We can all be using electricity to heat our homes using electric heat pumps. So that's the plan we've been working on for 15 years. Uh, and, and the goal, uh, but the, the Gulf of Maine has very deep waters. So the only way to put turbines in there is you got to float them. Uh, they got to float over the water. So we've been developing floating wind technologies starting 15 years ago. And, and uh, what we determined is that 60% of the offshore wind resource in the, in, in the United States is in deep water. And, and uh, 15 years ago, people questioned our sanity as a research center. And, and then just, uh, just two months ago, President Biden announced that uh, floating offshore wind is a US, US earth shot, one of five earth shots to uh, to uh, to combat climate change. So this is an idea that started at UMaine 15 years ago, and today it's a U.S. Earth shot. And um, and um, and then if you read the papers yesterday, uh, the legislature is looking at acquiring floating offshore wind energy. 
to bring into the U.S. grid right now. There's some bills being put in there to do that, all uh, that started from research at the University of Maine. Globally, there's a big race to build floating turbines. Uh, 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 and, and Maine is in the race, uh, and, and the U.S. is in that race. And the reason uh, the U.S. government uh, wanted it to be a U.S. Earthshot is to um, uh, fast forward ahead of the world in this very critical technology space and create the U.S. jobs, and, and of course, for us, the main jobs. We've built some facilities to allow us to, to learn how to do offshore wind and floating wind. This is a 165 foot long blade being tested in our laboratory at the university. That's, that's as long as a 16 story building. That's an example of some of the facilities we've built over the years to make us a world leader in this space. We've also built uh, the Wave Wind Basin thanks to an Alphon grant and, and state support and, and National Science Foundation support. This is the first facility in the United States uh, that uh, that combines uh, can put, do wind storms over wave storms. There are wave basins out there. There's wind tunnels out there, but nobody's put the two together yet. We're the first to do that, and we're using that to help drive technology forward uh, for all kinds of things that go in the ocean, including ships and vessels, but also offshore wind technology. Uh, to show you what it looks like when it's running, uh, this is this is um this is the wave maker uh, part of the facility, and in the back, it's an open jet wind tunnel. So essentially, we can recreate at scale just about any environment on Earth, and and our students and staff are, are busy developing new technologies uh, across the board uh, in in, in uh, renewable energy using a faci this facility. Uh, if you get a chance to come to UMaine, we're happy to show it to you. And this is an example of a of a floating wind turbine, um, right there. Um, that's a floating wind turbine being subjected to a 50-year storm um, at scale. So we built a turbine at scale uh, that's 150 scale versus what, what a bigger one would look like offshore. And, and now we're, we're proceeding forward. Uh, Thursday of last week, uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, that's a part of the Department of the Interior, um, uh, provided the state of Maine, uh, uh, said they're going to award us a lease. Uh, to put a, the first floating wind farm off the U.S. coast. Uh, that would be about 50 miles off the coast of Portland, Maine, uh, 20 miles south of Monhegan Island, and it will consist of 10, 15 megawatt units that look like that. To give you a sense of scale, this is a floating turbine, and I've got a little school bus in here. You see where my cursor is? Can you see that school bus? That gives you a sense of scale of these units. So the idea is to make these units, uh, fabricate them in Maine, and tow them out beyond the horizon to, to, to generate energy. Uh, each one of these units um, will be 15 to 20 megawatts in the future and, and uh, will provide enough energy for eight to 9,000 US homes. Um, this is a, a, a project, uh, that, a, a unit we launched in 2013, 10 years ago. Uh, it was built in our lab uh, and launched from Brewer, Maine. Uh, it's a floating turbine that we, we towed down the Penobscot River in here. Uh, and is a one one eight scale of a bigger unit, and and, uh, and we installed it off Castine in 2013, in June 2013, uh, and um, and this is the unit uh, in on, on December 15th 2013 uh, when it saw its first major winter winter storm. That's 10 years ago, and what you see blown across is not uh, uh, the amount of clouds that snow actually. And what you see, the white caps relative to the size of the hull, and even though the hull is floating, you don't see it moving. And, and that's that's part of the technology developed at UMaine that we have over 70 patents on is is how to design these very stable floaters that will sustain 50 and 500 year storms with very little movement. Um, so so th this this uh, proved the technology uh, back 10 years ago, and we won a a major grant, 50 million dollars from the U.S. Department of Energy to build the bigger one. And, and we're working on that as we speak. Uh, how, how is that moved to the seabed? It's moored right now with both a combination of steel chains and these uh, synthetic mooring lines. Notice how big they are. So you don't have to worry about whales being entangled in our mooring system. Uh, these looks like big telephone poles to a whale. You can't really be get, get entangled in it. So if anybody tells you it's, you're going to get entangled, you won't. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, and this is what the uh, research array would look like. The goal is to have it in the water in the 27 to 29 timeframe. Um, it would be 10 units. And the purpose of that is to 
uh, not only uh, uh, develop the technology and evaluate it, but also look at the environmental impacts, the ecological impacts. So there's teams of, of, of scientists at UMaine and beyond UMaine that will be working together with the state government to even, and, and the fishing industry and others and understand what the impact of these technologies are on the environment around them. And once we do that, then we'd be in a better position to potentially build uh, larger farms in the future. But it's exciting that just as last week that the federal government said, we're going to give you that area uh, off the coast of Maine to do this test. Uh, so, uh, and um, I'll move on to 3D printing, which is really what we, what, what the, 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 the major project ongoing in our laboratory. This is the largest uh, uh, 3D printer in the world, uh, polymer 3D printer in the world. It can print things about 20, uh, 60 feet long, 22 feet wide, and 10 feet high. And and and, uh, and for most of you who don't know how a printer works, uh, what we do is we melt pellets using this um, this um, this extruder head and, uh, and and deposit material from a pellet. Uh, uh, how many of you have used? Think of it. Have you used a heat gun, a, a welding gun? Uh, uh, so um, uh, plastic welding gun. You put plastic cartridges in that and heat them, and and, and they come out and they melt. If you took a, a, a gun like that, a, 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 a glue gun, uh, and and you 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 made a circle with your arm on the ground, you and, and then made another circle above it, and then another circle above it, and you kept doing that, you're adding layer over layer, and what you end up with is is a, is a tube, right? If you made them that way, if you added layer over layer, uh, and, and that's exactly what we're doing. But we're not putting plastic pellets, uh, pl plastic tubes in, in our gun. This is a very very big heat gun, essentially. <laughs> Think of it that way, a and we're putting pellets in it, and the pellets that we're using in that in that gun are made with wood. And, and bioresins. And we, la we deposit layer over layer to create structures. Uh, and then, um, so we're looking at a lot of different way uh, applications, including bridges, uh, boat building, offshore wind, and, and housing. These are some of the applications we're looking at. And then back in um, three years ago, many of you might have seen this, we printed the first 3D printed boat in the world using this, this, this technology. And that was printed in a little over a weekend. It was about a 25 foot vessel that weighed uh, 5,000 pounds. And that's the printer putting layer by layer by layer on top of each other to, to produce the boat. And um, again, we started on Thursday night and finished on Sunday night. Uh, and uh, and th this has never been done before. And, and, um, and that we learned a lot from this experiment and we've been increasing our knowledge and, 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 and improving the equipment since then. And um, and uh, that was back in 2013 with uh, with, with our congressional delegation. Uh, we took the boat and put it in our wave wind basin. And and um, and, uh, and the goal was to see how tough our congressional delegation was uh, to see if they would go in a 3D printed boat in a wave wind basin. And uh, we all survived. The the the, the boat did float, float uh, even though we didn't put a lot of waves on it. And you can see President Farini Mundi there in it. But, um, but let's go to the house a little bit. Um, so what we're trying to print the house with to drive costs down is wood waste, wood residuals from our forests. So um, right in the main forests, um, we, we have, uh, we, we've been using the wood in, 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 as a saw log in, in a lot of sawmills. So if you take a, a sawmill saw log, when you saw a log, a lot of that material doesn't make the grade. Back uh, when we had a lot of pulp and paper mills, that material used to go into, into the pulp and paper mills. But we had five, five pulp and paper mills shut down. So now we have a glut, if you wish, of that, of the wood residuals or, uh, from the sawmills. And what we do is we grind it up into a powder and, and we make it into pellets by combining it with a resin that look like that. And, and those pellets is what we feed the 3D printer with. So the 3D printer is printing with these pellets made with, uh, our, the goal is to make them with 50% wood and 50% bioresins. You may ask me, well, is there enough of these wood residuals in Maine to build homes? Uh, yet we, we did a survey and we have about a million tons of wood residuals every year in our region, in the sawmills, a million tons a year. And to put that in perspective, a 600 square foot home, which is what we printed, uses 10 tons, 10 tons of, of that material. So you take a million tons divided by 10 tons, that every year we have enough, mater enough material to produce a 100,000, 600 square foot home. Think about that. Of course, we're not gonna use 
the 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 the, uh, the, the word residual is just for printing homes, but that just shows you uh, how uh, there are other applications for that material. But that shows you how much of it there is out there. So, and and that that material is a lot cheaper than two by tens and two by twelves and and plywood and and OSB. So you, you're using a wood waste in essence that we think we can get at twenty cents a pound. If we can take that material and print homes with it, we've driven down the cost of materials for, for home construction, which is one of the big issues we're facing right now is material costs. Uh, um, and um, uh, the um, the other part is automation. So I'm gonna show you how we printed the home. But before I do that, um, uh, how many of you have heard of 3D printed concrete homes? Just, just, uh, just Google 3D printed homes. You'll see a lot of folks trying to print homes with concrete. But um, and they call them 3D printed homes. I just want to be aware though, <laughs> it's not a 3D printed home, it's just 3D printed walls. They don't print the whole house, they just print the walls. Okay. Because you can't print concrete in horizontal surfaces in concrete in thin air, right? So because it's not going to hold together. Uh, so what they do is they they've placed a concrete foundation if they're going to print a 3D printed home, and they run a printer. Uh, it's it basically it's a concrete bucket essentially that pours pours concrete down layer by layer, uh, and, and they build they build the walls of the home, and then they pull the printer out, and now they've got the walls of the home. They've got a foundation that was built in a conventional manner, and they bring roof trusses, uh, uh, wood wood roof trusses, and stick built the roof and finish the house in a conventional manner. So they've only printed the walls, uh, and what we wanted to do is print the whole thing. To, to reduce the cost, to reduce the time actually to, to do it. But but also uh, concrete is not necessarily the most green greenest material in the world and you can't recycle it. In Maine, we have all this wood waste. So we thought, well, we can do it differently by using the wood waste instead of using concrete. And and what we wanted to do is be able to do it year round. If you, in Maine, if you try to print a concrete home like that, you're limited to, uh, you can't be printing in the middle of the winter uh, with a concrete printer out there, or or you, uh, or if it's raining out there, the weather gets bad, you gotta stop. And actually people doing this are running into this issue right now uh, in, in the Southern parts of the country where, okay, I wanna print the home, now the weather gets really bad, you gotta shut everything down and go home. <laughs> and and so, so, um, so what we've chosen to do is rather than, than print only the walls of the home, we're printing the entire home, the roof, the walls, the floors, and making modules in a, in a fabricated facility. These modules are small enough that you can actually take them to the site and assemble them back together. So the approach we're taking is different. We're using materials that are 100% renewable, 100% uh, recyclable. We're printing the whole house, not just the walls, and we're doing it year round in, 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 in prefabricated prefabricating modules and taking them to the site. So I'll show you a video of how we've done this house. <clears throat> um, so this is one of the modules of the home being printed. No, notice the cavities in the walls. Uh, I'm gonna freeze it for a minute. Uh, and and uh, notice the roof and the walls have cavities. Notice uh, that's the roof structure. It looks like a truss, doesn't it? Okay. But the printer is putting it layer by layer and making that happen, and and it looks like wood because it is wood. You know, it's a it's brownish color, and and the resin we're using is bio based that kind of glues the wood together, and that that head here is depositing the material layer by layer, and and creating the roof truss at the same time as it's creating the walls at the same time as created the floors. So we're printing the whole thing, the whole modules. Here we go. The roof's coming together. Notice that. Um, that's the roof truss, if you wish. And, and what we do here is, uh, once we finish printing the module, we, we blew uh, uh, cellulose insulation, wood insulation, into the into the cavities, and we had we pre-wired the house with 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 the electrical wiring. So the house, the, the module had electrical uh, wiring running through it. It, had, it was insulated, and, and and the house we made in four modules like that, and they're light enough that you can pick them up and put them on a truck and take them to site. That's what we did. So that's the roof and the wall coming together, all printed at once. And now uh, we've taken these modules and we, we blew insulation into the modules, as you see, and we lifted the modules, backed up a flat that truck uh, in our, into our lab, and, and you could see a module going to the side outside our building. And um, so this is our lab, and that's the foundation where we placed the home. And you could see this module being placed down in there. It already has electricity uh, wiring going into it. It's got the, it's got the uh, insulation in it. 
in the future would like to put the kitchen right in it if you wish we haven't done that in this particular case but we could do that in the future now we we did it in in four modules like, just like that and because the 3d printed they fit together very well and, and it took less than a day to bring the modules together uh bring them from the lab you could see here our students and staff um, pulling it together that's another modules coming in and, and um and then um and what's what's really interesting in all this is um is that um, we, we installed the modules in less than a day and then uh, the electrician arrived to the site and within two hours we had electricity running in the house okay because it was all pre-wired so so that's how quickly we we're able to do that now imagine a day where you can sit on your computer screen and you go to a website and you can you have mo different models of homes and you can move the walls around and make the living room bigger or make the, make the bathroom bigger or whatever you want and then push the button say order one and and uh, and then it could be 3D printed and and maybe in a week or two you can you can have delivery of a house that's custom designed to your needs. Now we're not there yet, of course, but that's where we're heading in the future. And imagine a day where um, we have factories like this that can produce these located across the country, and where we could take these um, wood pallets that we make in Maine that have that have the wood and the resin in them and ship them across the country to feed these factories, and, and, and that we're looking at. And, but the pallets can also be made in other places around around the country um, uh, where, where there's a lot of wood resources. Um, the pallets don't have to be, the, the, the fiber doesn't have to be wood. It could also be agricultural waste, such as uh, corn stalk, for example, that you, we've done that as well with it. So, um, but imagine this house is also 100% recyclable. Uh, so our, our children and grandchildren, uh, 200 years from now, would say, well, I don't want the house anymore. We can grind it up. And print something else with it in the future. And we're testing now five different use cycles. So, uh, and every time uh, we, we print something, we, we grind it up, print something else, and see what happens to the properties, because the properties will change, will degrade over time. And we're doing it five times to look at five reuse cycles. And since these homes have cellulose in them and wood in them, and if the wood is, is, is grown sustainably, uh, you're locking carbon into this house. So this house becomes like a carbon storage facility because the the carbon the the uh, the, the cellulose is, is in the home. Um, so um, so what's next? Okay, where do we go from all of this? Um, what what's um, what's next is um, making sure it really works, right? And um, and so we uh, so we're, we're running a test outside our our lab. This is what it looks like. Um, and uh, I'm pleased to tell you, we've had uh, a major windstorm here, as you know, a month ago that shut down electricity in many parts of Maine and held up very well. It's, it's designed, of course, to, to, uh, to, to meet all building code requirements, and it's got a PE stamp on it. But uh, there's quite a bit of snow on the roof. It's looking real good. We've got sensors all over this house uh, to, to monitor its structural performance, but as well as its thermal performance. Uh, and uh, so it's going through a good old main winter, and and we're going to see learn a lot from that, and hopefully the next one will be made a lot better. And just last week, uh, you can uh, if you read today's Bangor Daily News actually, or yesterday's Bangor Daily News, we partnered with Pointquis. Uh, a, a, it's a not for profit organization, and we've been working with Main Housing, and uh, they've announced that they're going to do a three D printed neighborhood using our technology in Bangor for homeless, a, and. Um, but before we get there, of course, we, we got to scale up the production of this technology. And uh, and um, uh, and here's the people who are making it happen. These are the researchers, students, and staff in our laboratory and with our partners uh, who are working to make BioHome 3D happen. They're they're the they're the they're the ones who 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 um, take the credit, uh, not me, for for developing these technologies. I'd like to point out Evan Gilman. Uh, Evan Gilman right here uh, uh, is was in charge of doing it all, and and I gave him all the credit for coordinating. He was a, uh, the the four star general, if you wish, in charge of the project. And and and, and this gentleman uh, was at Bath Ironworks, um, and and um, uh, before he came to us a couple of years ago, less than uh, less than two years ago, he was um, he uh, managed three thousand people at Bath Ironworks manufacturing destroyers and, and and so forth and wanted to do something different in his life and, and benefit society. But think about this person who's manufacturing the, some of the most complex structures uh, in the world uh, came to us and he's working with us to try to develop these th technology to the next level. That's the kind of firepower you have in here. Dr. Susan McKay up here is in charge of the, um, uh, the developing the materials uh, along with Dr. Uh, 
uh, Gardner uh, from the University of Maine, who's also developing the materials. So it's a great team, and 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 it, we we give them the credit for 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 doing this, and they're very excited to take things to the next level. So what's the next level? We got to speed up the technology development, and we got to start cranking these things out a lot faster than we are now. Uh, our goal is to be able to print a home like this every 48 hours. So. As part of that, we're developing what we call the factory of the future at the University of Maine. It's in addition to our laboratory uh, that will allow us to actually scale up the technology uh, and, and it's bring in digital manufacturing and it's bringing additive manufacturing along with other manufacturing processes together um, and, and, and bringing um, uh, high performance computing and sensing to develop a closed loop manufacturing system to help scale up the technology. Uh, it's not easy, it's not simple, uh, but our goal is to scale the technology up. Uh, and as of today, we've, uh, we're in the middle of designing this facility. Uh, and it's not going to be just a research laboratory, it's going to be an education facility as well. Uh, as you know, the university is developing, uh, merging the College of Engineering as well as School of Computing and Information Sciences. And we're working with with both programs right now to to uh, to use this facility as a proving ground uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and an education facility for the for these new programs that bring engineering and computing together. Why do we need computing? Uh, because um, this facility is a digital manufacturing facility that uh, that doesn't exist anywhere else in the, in, in the world, and and it it brings together. Um, think about as you're printing a home, uh, you can. Um, you can sense how you're printing it. You can scan the part as you print it and, and send all that information to computing uh, and, and AI and, and, and then go back and uh, in real time uh, fix it if, if there's something wrong. And, and that's that's where we're heading with developing these technologies. Super. Thank you very much. I mean, it's just fascinating as always to uh, hear your presentations and uh, have benefited from uh, a tour of your facility that uh, you gave me, which is terrific. So uh, we do have a few questions and I'll remind the audience that if you have any questions, we'll, we'll keep going for another uh, 13 minutes here. Um, I do have a few questions already, but you can chat questions to Nicolette Hashi, who is one of the hosts on the Zoom, uh, and she'll relay them to me. Um, so uh, Dr. Darger, let's just start with, uh, we had a question about uh, the relationship with Penquist that was just announced. Um, and do you know more about the vision there? Will that be a, a neighborhood, all the homes close by together for homeless population? Is that the idea? Uh, that's the idea. That's correct, Tom. And, and again, we're at the very beginning stages of the design. This, this hasn't been designed yet. But um, but uh, Penquist has been partnering with us for a number of years now uh, on developing uh, this technology. Um, they've received funding, $3 million of funding um, from the federal government for this development. And they've and also key bank uh, put in $300,000 as well towards the devel development of the, of the uh, 3D printed neighborhood. We expect it to have nine uh, 3D printed homes. We haven't designed these homes yet. Um, and, and our goal is to produce them in the factory of the future. So we got to get build the factory of the future first before we can actually build those homes. Um, but um, uh, it, it, we're very excited because at the end of the day, that's really what we want to do, be able to drive costs down and, 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 and the impact uh, populations that don't have homes today or can't afford homes today. That's great. Well, that sort of leads into another question. I think I'm, I'm not sure you have a definite answer on this, but we, someone asked, when will these types of homes be available to purchase? Um, we got to build, the, as I said, once one step at a time. Um, we, we hope in about five years, we should be able to do that. Um, but uh, we're not going to be waiting for five years. As, as you know, the first thing we're doing is we're, we're putting the first home through a good old main winner. And we got to do that first. We got to do our homework, make sure it works, make sure there's no issues. We're going to learn a lot from that. We're already learning a lot. And next, we're going to build the factory of the future to figure out how to scale up the manufacturing. We got to, we can't just do them one at a time like that in a laboratory, right? We got to start scaling that up. And the factory of the future will allow students and staff and faculty to really innovate and figure out how to scale these technologies up. And um, so, so the goal right now is to start construction of the factory of the future a year from now. Uh, we have uh, uh, over 12 uh, uh, project implementation teams working with architects right now to design the facility and design the robotics for it. And, uh, and uh, uh, the University of Maine has been very busy 
We're working with our president and the chancellor and 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 and, and others uh, to raise money for this facility. Uh, we're close to we're at 80 million dollars right now um, uh, of funding raised for the facility, and we need 115. And just about um, uh, so that's important to get the financing finished for the facility. So we got about 30 35 million uh, more that's needed out, out of 115. And and um, and uh, just a, a week ago we we had a the the new legislature. The legislature was was at the university and had dinner in our lab and. Senator Jackson stood up and, and said that uh, he would like to put together a bill, uh, 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 $30 million, $35 million um, bond for to help finish this facility. He's a, As you know, he's a Senate president, and he said uh, he'd like to, uh, every one of the legislators to support him. So so we hope that that will happen and, and, uh, in, in the next legislative session, and, uh, and uh, certainly any support from the alumni to make that happen would be very helpful as well. So, so, the, so the next phase is building the factory of the future. Uh, at the lab, and, and then then starting to use the factory to to um, to uh, to demonstrate and build homes, and and the the, the Pequus project, the homeless project, will be built in the factory of the future. So it'll be the first neighborhood to be to be produced in the factory of the future. So right, right. Um, could you speak to the length of time that it took to print the home? The first one way too long because yeah. we we're designing and building equipment as we printed it, and uh, I can tell you uh, we 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 broke our equipment a few times along the way. We had to go back and redesign the equipment and build new equipment, and so it was really a it was a research and development project. But um, but I'm going to tell you how, how much progress we've made. Uh, when we started printing, we started printing at 30 pounds an hour. In other words, that extruder head was extruding material at, at 30 pounds every hour. When we finished printing this home, we're doing it at 120 pounds per hour at four times the speed. And just a month ago, we installed an extruder head that takes us to 500 pounds an hour, and we're using it today as we speak. Uh, so think about going from 30 pounds an hour to 500 pounds an hour. It's, it's, it's a game changer. And our goal in the fact of the future is to get down to a uh, thousand pounds an hour of, of material deposition by having two of them working, two 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 heads working together, uh, uh, and that that house weighs about forty thousand pounds. I showed you at a thousand pounds an hour is forty hours. So mm -hmm. the answer is our goal is to get to forty hours. Uh, or, or, so print one of these homes every two days. Uh, we're not there yet by any means, but that's our goal, and we're we're getting we're we're, we're inching up towards that goal. So that's as we great. So. Um, Next question relates to, um, is it possible to give the modules any ratings for fire protection? I know you and I chatted a little bit about that when I visited with you. Th that's, again, part of what we're doing, absolutely. So the goal is to be able to meet all the fire and toxicity protections uh, for homes by putting additives in the resin that will that will uh, get us there. And we, we have a team uh, with Dr. Um, uh, uh, Gardner and Dr. Mc Susan McKay and Dr. Doug Gardner working on these uh, with our engineers and uh, in a, so uh, we believe we have ideas to to make this happen. Yes, um, and uh, we're, and we're heading in that direction. So that's great. Um, I had a question about the plumbing in the home. Can you just speak to a little bit to how that was all uh, done? Yeah. So in this house, we, we did it the good old way. In other words, when we finished doing the modules. Uh, we basically we had cavities in the walls, as I showed you, and we ran we, we ran the the electrical wiring and the plumbing in the cavities that we had. In the factory of the future, the goal is to actually produce the um, the conduits um, as you print the home. So so the conduits, the electrical chases, and plumbing chases will all be produced within the wall as you produce it, and and the insulation will be put in as you're actually printing this home as well. Uh, and uh, but the first one we didn't do it that way; we did it the, the the old fashioned way. But now now uh, that's where we're heading next. So super. Um, next question is about the source of the bioresin. Can you speak to where where that all comes from? Yeah, we're doing a lot of research on different kinds of bioresins right now. We're canvassing all the different possibilities. Uh, they're basically most of these resins will be derived from uh, from sugars that come out of plants of some sort. Uh, it come out of the trees. It come out of corn. Um, in our case, we did it uh, from a resin that that was derived from corn in this particular case, but it's not necessarily where we'll end up in the end. So that's great. Um, I think a couple of these that you've um, addressed, but let me just ask you this one looks um, how does the amount of energy used to create a 3D printed home compare to that of a conventional home on a per square foot basis? 
Yeah, again, so Dr. Susan McKay uh, is, is leading up a team of, enge of engineers and students who are actually running all the all those numbers as we speak. And, and of course, the first one we did, uh, you know, is not really where we're going to head. We're going to become a lot more efficient when we do it one every 48 hours, and, and we're going to do it a lot faster. So we, we believe uh, certainly our, the carbon footprint of these homes would be significantly less during construction and during operations uh, than, than normal homes. But again, the numbers are being developed and 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 uh, and will continually be updated as we up improve the processes. So, great. Next question relates to uh, the impact of three D homes on uh, traditional building trades, and would you anticipate um, more or less labor might be needed um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, building homes in this manner? Certainly, right now, the industry does not have enough people to build homes. That's why we don't have homes, essentially. Uh, the trades uh, can't uh, can't pro pro provide uh, the supply. So we don't see this technology as replacing homes, but ad adding more homes uh, home stock, if you wish, in, into the marketplace. Um, so um, so uh, I, I don't see uh, traditional home construction going away anytime soon. That's really not, not what we've been doing these things. We're building homes the same way for two, three hundred years right now, and and we're going to continue to do that and in large numbers. But this technology is going to add to the to the stock that exists today. It's going to be part of the solution, not the only solution. So uh, to the marketplace, in terms of how much labor a home like this would take to make, it would be less for sure because we're using automation to produce the home. But once you finish the home, uh, when you when you print the structure of the home, you still have to come in there. You got to install. The kitchen so the, the the and that's not going to go away you're going to install the uh the kitchen cabinets the, the 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 kitchen sink and the bathrooms and so forth uh fixtures all of that will still be done um at least initially uh, uh in, in in traditional ways so that's great um we uh have a couple couple more time for a couple more questions um does the uh, material for the home um degrade from uh ultraviolet or water over time? Yeah, we've, uh, again, I'd like to go back to Dr. Doug Gardner, who's really been pioneering the development of these materials in our laboratory for over 20 years. Uh, so we've been extruding these materials and testing them around the world. And um, and the bottom line is, it, they fare much better than pressure treated wood uh, in the outdoor environment. Uh, the compressive strength of these materials uh, uh, is more than concrete. Uh, and, and uh, and and the, the wood fiber doesn't biodegrade in there because it's encapsulated in the resin. So you by by cutting off oxygen and water from the wood fiber, uh, you don't get biodegradation. The fungi can't get in there and eat the wood because the fungi that actually degrade the wood need oxygen and water, and we cut that off. Uh, and so so the materials uh, we we expect to be more durable than normal wood construction. Um, and um, but as we develop these materials, we'll continually test them and evaluate and improve them. In terms of UV light, um, uh, we we have UV inhibitors that we add into the resin that will give us UV uh, protection that we that we require for various uh, end use environments. So. Great. Um, one last question we have time for, which I'm sure is on a lot of people's minds, is: Is there any plan for alumni or members of the public who might want to come and see? the printed home to do so? And how, how would that work? Absolutely. So right on our website, you can sign up. We have uh, sign up to print the home. We have times where we to see the home. Uh, we have times uh, scheduled in uh, on our website, ASCC website, um, Advanced Structures and Composites website. If you go there and go to Buy a Home 3D, you can actually sign up for it, for it, for a tour and they're scheduled or pre-scheduled at, at different times of the week. So yeah, and uh, that's we're getting a large, large interest in uh, in it. So I'm sure, I'm sure you are. Well, uh, well, we're up against the clock here, Dr. Habib Bagger. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, uh, share with us all the exciting things that are happening at the Advanced Structures and Composite Center. So um, thank you again to uh, President Fernie Mundy for being with us, to you, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, we invite you to check humanealumni.com for other alumni in-person and virtual events coming up and uh, please keep in touch. Uh, thanks again, everybody for joining us today.